right, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. I'm very, very excited to bring to you the next in our series uh, of webinars uh, related to our HealthSpan show. And this one is looking at the gamification of cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy to improve long-term mental fitness. We've got a really brilliant panel uh, for you today. So I'll be handing over to them in just a moment. But before we get going, I'd like to remind you that you can um, use the chat function as much as you like if you'd like to communicate with other people who are on this webinar. If you do have questions for our panel, please use the Q&A function. Uh, it's much, much easier for our, um, our moderator and panelists to follow that workflow. So if you can use the Q&A, that means that they'll be able to get to your questions. All right, so without further ado, I'm very pleased to hand over to our moderator for today, Tina Woods. Thank you so much, Angela. I'm really pleased to be here today. So um, I'll introduce my my um, uh, my expert panelists in just a second, uh, but just uh, very briefly to introduce myself. So I'm Tina Woods. I'm CEO and founder of Collider Health. Uh, I've been involved um, uh, in, in mental health um, innovation and technology for, for quite some time, having worked uh, also with insurers on mental health and wellbeing programs, including in the tech space, and of course with public sector as well, apps um, uh, in, in the NHS um, apps library, for example. So I'm really, really pleased that we're exploring this topic, which is a uh, very high interest, particularly as we're sort of emerging from uh, the COVID pandemic, where of course mental health has been such a big issue um, for all of us. Uh, today we're looking at, as Angela said, on the gamification of CBT um, and uh, really excited to explore some of the, the opportunities and also some of the challenges with our panelists. So I will I will um, ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves, but very, very quickly, um, the four we have here today are Bruce Elliott, who's CEO of Memory Lane Games, um, uh, Amir Bazargazadeh, uh, who's co-founder and CEO of Virtual Leap. Um, we have Aaron Warwick, uh, who's founder and CEO of Elevate. And finally, we have Lloyd Humphreys, um, who's head of Europe, Silver Cloud Health. So I'm going to ask in the order that I've just described for everyone just to very briefly um, introduce themselves. But we're going to save, um, so we're going to have a conversation. So we're going to kind of keep it keep it lively. And so with that, Angela had mentioned, uh, you know, to please feel free to, to send your questions on chat, um, or on the, sorry, on the Q&A function. And we I will regularly sort of look at that. Um, and of course, I've got loads of questions myself. So um, I'm just going to, um, uh, so, so Bruce, would would you like to go first? Thank you. I, I would love to. So Bruce Elliott, CEO of Memory Lane Games. We're a digital dementia therapy care app. We create the simplest frustration-free quiz style games localized all over the world. So we're working with national Alzheimer's associations in the Philippines, in Uganda, and on other continents as well to deliver our digital dementia therapy. We're running a uh, randomized controlled observational study trial, uh, starts recruitment next month on our app. And, um, and, and we think that you know, gamification is critical, critical to bringing um, accessibility, for, especially for mental health, for we, we take care of both patient, dementia patients and carers. And we think improving mental health of both is critical. Thank you so much, uh, Bruce. Uh, and I know we've got lots of questions around accessibility, which we'll come on to later. So Amir, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I'm Amir Bozorzadeh, uh, co-founder and CEO of Virtual Leap. Our company is uh, right at the intersection of virtual reality and the neurosciences. We've created a, a library of VR games designed by our neuroscientists to test and train a range of cognitive abilities, not just the standard ones like memory and problem solving and information processing, but also motor controls, spatial orientation, and spatial audio awareness. Um, just three minutes of playing our games generates volumetric data sets that are like unprecedented. You'd have to put together a Frankenstein of different types of biometric and biosensory uh, devices to collect the level of and magnitude of data about the human condition that we are doing. And we're partnered with um, a number of institutes across the US and Europe to validate our solution uh, with our first study beginning actually recruitment this month in Barcelona. Um, themed across the board from chemo brain to ADHD to TBI, um, of course, mild cognitive impairment. Um, and it's a really exciting space to be and I'm, I'm very happy to be here to share more. Thank you so much, Amir. And I know I've got loads of questions on the technology, but also just this explosion of new think, new science, you know, on, on, on the whole sort of cognitive and, and neuroscience domain. It's absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much, Amir. Um, Aaron, over to you. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Aaron Warwick. It's an honor to be here. 
I am the co-founder and CEO of Elevate. Elevate is a Washington DC metropolitan based mobile app startup. Um, Elevate is a mental wellness and inspirational living self-care mobile application that simply serves as a personal guide to mental, physical and emotional success. Uh, we encourage wellness and inspire our users to live fully. And we do this by equipping them to overcome adversity with um, bite-sized pieces of wisdom, guidance and inspiration. We do this by utilizing predictive analytics, um, machine learning and monitoring user behavior to provide a personalized user experience. Um, that's a, pretty much a, a bit of Elevate, but I'll love to dive in a bit more throughout the conversation. Thank you so much, Aaron. I'm really, really interested to, to learn more about um, accessing um, disadvantaged groups as well, which I know you're very, very focused on. Um, so Lloyd, over to you. Hi there. So I'm Lloyd Humphreys. I'm the head of Europe for Silver Cloud. Um, but by background, I'm actually a clinical psychologist by training. So a clinician first and foremost. And Silver Cloud Health is the leading digital mental health and well-being platform that's used globally across 300 plus organization, having helped change the lives of over 600,000 people with over 35 plus research studies, including uh, five randomized controlled trials, including the, the only long term follow up of, of digital kind of uh, CBT uh, for, for mental health. Health. And we have over 30 plus programs, um, which are used right across the full continuum of mental health and well-being, as well as the full age range. So as young as helping parents to, to kind of help manage the anxiety of children as young as four years old, all the way up to being used by older adults. And digital therapy is obviously uh, using the latest technology to engage with people in a meaningful way. Uh, so we're constantly evolving how people kind of use the platform and then we engage in, in new and different ways. Fantastic, Lloyd. So I'm going to um, open up with a fairly general question, which is kind of an obvious one, but I think is a really important one as well, um, which is uh, clearly, you know, mental health uh, has become, well, I think it's increasingly being recognized how we have to take mental health far more seriously than perhaps um, we have before. And certainly the pandemic has, com has completely sort of opened up, I guess, awareness and of course the growing need because it has been really, really hard, especially in certain groups during lockdown. In fact, I mean, all age groups have been affected, some more than others. But do you think, I, I'm gonna go in, in turn in the order that, we, that we've just started, uh, in turn just to get your perspectives on um, whether the digital transformation that we have seen with the pandemic and of course we have seen an, an acceleration of that. Um, is it here to stay and has it actually made, um, opened up opportunities that perhaps weren't there before? Um, so I'm gonna just go around. Bruce, um, would you like to answer that question first? Sure, I, I think it absolutely is here to stay. The, uh, the elderly populations we work with are becoming more and more tablet friendly, not necessarily Zoom friendly, but at least tablet friendly and are, uh, are engaging uh, with these new technologies, as long as they're simple enough. And that's what we strive to do is bring really, really simple um, applications. But I also think that um, the, the global impact on, on social isolation is has been crushing, especially on carers of dementia patients. And I think that um, um, giving something to improve their quality of life is something that will always be uh, desired. And I think it's really been brought to the forefront with COVID. So, and just a question, did you, uh, was there, a, so have you seen the, um, I guess, uh, more awareness of the special needs of carers through through the pandemic, would you say? Yeah. yeah that's that's who's writing into us every day. Uh, well, speech therapists and carers are writing in and, yeah. uh, and saying thank you for this, uh, mm -hmm. for this app. And I think that, um, that finding ways to put a smile on someone's face during these mm -hmm. really tough times is is so important. Yeah. And um, I think we're forgetting how, how how crushing it can be on the carers as well. So their mental health, really important and, and giving them breaks and, mm -hmm. and giving them rewarding activities that they can participate alongside those in their care is really important. Mm, absolutely. Um, uh, so uh, Amir, what would you say to the same question? I think it's a good question because you should always try to scrutinize uh, anything that might be hyped up, you know, we always see these things kind of come about and then implode. But in this particular case, I think it's been so severe and dramatic that, for example, the regulatory bodies have made certain, you know, moves that were accelerated and now they're here to stay. For example, for the VR space, that's, you know, my purview, um, the, the FDA introduced a, a new category called medical extended reality. Um, they've created a, offered breakthrough uh, status for uh, one VR gamified uh, company, Applied VR, for their pain management solution. Um, on, 
outside of the VR space, even in June last year, Achille Interactive's Endeavor RX has become the first video game to be declared a prescribed treatment for pediatric ADHD. So, I mean, these are like, uh, you know, landing on the moon kind of moves that have, for whatever, you know, reason that has brought them about are now here to stay. And that's not something that can implode. Um, now that they're supported by the regulatory bodies, we can expect it to be a trend that will follow for the next decade in very exciting ways. Fantastic. And I, I just got a question here, which is related to the question, but maybe a little bit more precise in terms of potentially the, the answer that we might want to give. Uh, how has the pandemic changed the process of the way that you have utilized gamification in your technology? So um, perhaps um, Aaron and Loy, when I turn to you, if perhaps you can give that um, a slightly bigger focus in your response. <clears throat> Absolutely. I would love to. So I noticed during this time of the pandemic, 35% um, of adults experienced some type of mental distress um, during lockdown. Um, isolation due to the current climate of lockdown um, directly correlates with increased levels of anxiety, depression, and other mental illness issues. Um, during this time, this has encouraged people to not only speak, but to educate each other on the process of mental health and well-being and different approaches to uh, tackle that solution. Um, new organizations have been formed. Um, we work with different industries as far as um, child education, patient monitoring programming, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and they have taken the forefront on mental health. I always say um, social distance does not mean social um, disengagement. And I believe that others have taken on that and really provided a platform to speak with one another. Um, digitally, we see people having more Zoom conferences um, and utilizing other platforms such as Instagram, such as Elevate, such as um, you know, uh, other chat-based programs and they're communicating and speaking to one another. So I believe it's here to stay. Um, and we're seeing the beginning of this digital transformation around the mental wellness space. Fantastic, thank you, Aaron. And Lloyd, what's your view on this? Absolutely, thank you very much. And, and to, to Aaron's point, the, this whole kind of notion of socially distancing um, for, for me kind of really is, is a bit like fingers down a chalkboard because we should be physically distancing, not socially distancing. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that, that very few people have kind of dwelt on, that we need to kind of keep physical distance for, for viral transmission. But actually, we need to kind of be socially closer than we've ever been uh, using new technologies to, to kind of do so. So I, I kind of really dislike the, the kind of the social distancing kind of uh, the use of that sort of language. Um, in terms of kind of the digital transformation though, um, when we kind of look at digital transformation, often what we're trying to do is replace one other way of working, whether that's kind of a physical face-to-face -face treatment or whether that's another type of therapy, you know, or, or whichever. We're, we're trying to kind of replace to kind of get the efficiencies, to kind of get the outcomes, et cetera. Now that's really difficult um, to replace another way of working. Usually what happens is uh, this new approach is kind of layered on top of everything else. And so that means people have more to do. They, they kind of have other things as well. And, and that's where digital transformation is really tough. With the pandemic, what we found is some ways of working, physical face-to-face -face therapy uh, and other approaches weren't, were no longer possible. So actually it wasn't layered on top. One bit was taken out and, and, and digital was kind of slotted in. And so for that, that meant that we could uh, kind of have that forced transformation. Now, as we kind of go back after the pandemic, what we're going to kind of find is rather than thinking whether we should kind of adopt digital, we're going to be kind of asking ourselves, should we readopt our old way of working? And in some instances, it might be a little bit, and sometimes it might be a little bit more, but this transformation is here to stay. Maybe not at the same levels as during the pandemic, but we're going to be asking ourselves new questions in terms of whether we replace digital rather than when we adopt it. And that's going for, for me a really exciting place for us to be in. When we think about kind of gamification for mental health, to, to, to your point in that specific question, Tina, um, I think kind of gamification really offers us an opportunity to kind of look at how we present cognitive behavioral therapy. Traditionally, when we have a look at CBT, it's a, uh, it's a therapeutic episode of care typically kind of one session, two sessions, etc. And so what gamification allows you to do is to kind of um, chunk that up into bite-sized 
elements. And for that person to kind of dip in and out of that uh, process as they kind of see fit. And so I think we can kind of take a lot of the gamification and apply that to, to those evidence-based approaches to present it in, in new ways that allows people to kind of have that on-demand help. And then that's something that Silver Cloud is, is very much working towards, you know, having that episode of care for those people that really want that kind of treatment approach, but then being able to kind of offer new bite sized on demand approaches for those that want to kind of dip in and out. And that allows you to kind of work on prevention, well-being, as well as kind of diagnostic approaches. Really interesting. And I, I it, it, that's triggered, I think, a question in my own mind, because what you um, what's great about and there are some questions as to whether, you know, digital therapy can, can be as effective as traditional sort of face to face therapies. And that will come on to in a second. But I think you measured, you know, the, the evidence base and also being able to dip in and out over time, because that, of course, one of the things that is certainly in, in certainly in the mental health context is you do want to be able to, to track progress over time and having the evidence to provide some sort of measure of whether you are getting better or not and something that other people can also access. So just a note, I guess maybe just a bit of a discussion around this ability to track progress over time, keeping a record of it, involving others, you know, who might need to be involved in that. That, that process of caring for the individual and the evidence. Just, a, I guess, a little bit of discussion about, around that because that, of course, is something that the digital element does have huge advantages. So perhaps a little, little um, discussion around that. I don't know who would like to go first. Well, I'm, I, I think that's a, a fascinating topic because we, we see Gamification brings uh, not only engagement, but also adherence. Mm. And uh, for us, game, gamification isn't about scoring, it's about mm. rewarding. And I think extending the time and uh, activity in, in cognitive stimulating um, in games in our case. So I think that um, using, um, uh, once as we go through our clinical trial in our next phases, as we're uh, allowing families to, to opt in, uh, we will definitely be able to track performance over time. And I think that's where it gets exciting on, in our cases, uh, accuracy on uh, facial detection games, and then followed by perhaps accuracy on 3D spatial awareness games. Those things can lead to interesting potential um, digital biomarkers. And I think those are the, the things that, that gamification in digital can really, really deliver. Absolutely. And I'm going to bring in um, Amir here, because you mentioned uh, a word that I love is digital biomarkers. And I know that's very much in the sweet spot of what Amir is doing. Um, so Amir, would you like to comment on that? And just also where, where you see, see the future going in terms of, you know, being able to track and measure um, uh, biomarkers and how that feeds into the overall sort of management strategies of the future? Yeah, it kind of, kind of connects with what Bruce was saying, you know, on, on top of adherence, it's also a gamification makes experiences more compelling. And the more engaged someone is, I think we're more and more we're seeing that the quality of the data, um, you know, correlates to that and, and, and superiority of, of quality, you know, and it's something that we can, on the one hand, be more reliable, more consistent. Um, but on the VR side of things, we're talking about volumetric data sets that are, are, you know, not only just engaging you cognitively, but also emotionally and experientially, um, which I guess is always the ultimate holy grail goal of any gamification uh, sort of endeavor. Um, for example, in a virtual reality setting, um, if I'm standing on a tall, a, a very tall precipice, my um, phobia of heights doesn't care that I'm in my living room. It, my knees will start to shake and tremble regardless of me knowing I'm in a safe location. Um, and that's the kind of specialty of, of virtual reality um, that it does trick the autonomic nervous system and vestibular balance system to believing the experience is real. And therefore the quality of the data includes the believability of, of the whole whole body. Um, when that goes into the format of these volumetric data sets, um, um, there's profound applications um, on many fronts, but on the one that we're particularly focused on is in um, essentially applying AI learning tools to create biomarkers that can detect the subtle changes over longitudinal tracking of cognitive performance and see if those, those you know, games that you're playing for 15 minutes per day can ultimately serve as a non-invasive um, you know, detection tool in and of itself that might prompt you to go and check out a specialist or go to an fMRI machine that otherwise typically have taboos built in or maybe just not accessible uh, whatsoever. So 
it's very early days in our biomarker work, but it's, it, 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 it uh, invariably includes uh, having AI talent brought into the fold um, and, and being able to leverage that, which uh, I think is the most exciting um, aspect of, of our work. And just a very quick question, just also on the very specific areas that you're looking at now. I mean, you mentioned ADHD. I mean, where do you see that your technology is having most application? <clears throat> so, you know, um, I feel like right now, especially with the VR uh, entrepreneur, we, we kind of like beggars can't be choosers kind of feeling about things, you know, until like about a couple of years ago with COVID accelerating demand for all sorts of wacky technologies like ours. Um, otherwise, it was kind of a nuclear winter we were going through where VR was considered a, a gaming engine, not something for serious applications, where in fact, the only critical use cases for virtual reality are either education or healthcare applications. Um, uh, and so as a beggar's can't be choosers kind of mentality, it kind of still exists right now where we look for partners, research partners who have their own mission, their own agenda, and we try to enable them with our technology and that will maybe go in one direction or another depending on who they are. So for example, the VA healthcare system in San Francisco, we're working with them in uh, UCSF and they're focused I, honestly on, on, on TBI, traumatic brain injury and, and addiction as a high risk factor towards developing cognitive impairment. And so our focus is there with them to do that research. With Val de Braun in, in uh, Barcelona, their focus is on type two diabetes as a high risk factor towards cognitive impairment. So we're focused on there. That said, um, you know, the one uh, focus we really, really do have regardless of all those areas pushing us and pulling us in the wind um, is, is mild cognitive impairment um, and Alzheimer's disease, yeah. uh, just because it's just the most dramatically and most scary condition I could imagine. Um, I don't think any, I think Bill Gates was the one that said, you know, the one thing that scares him the most in the world is his memory or brain stopped working. I, I probably would agree with him there as, as well. It's a terrifying disease. Yesterday, um, Tina, I have to mention, I, I, I forgot my pin code for my bank, my <laughs> bank card. And I was like, what the heck is going on? I've used this a thousand times. Where is that number? I did it wrong th three times. And right when it ate my, uh, my card, then I remembered it. And I was like, wow, I'm, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a scary feeling even in a microcosmic situation. Well, that could have been stress, of course. <laughs> that made yes. you think. Um, sure. But listen, I, there's a few questions coming through on the chat, but just to give um, uh, Aaron and Lloyd just, a, you know, a, a, some uh, uh, comments on this whole notion around uh, tracking progress and the sort of the evidence uh, collection. Did you want to have any sort of uh, views, perspectives on that, each of you? Sure, I'll hop in on that one. Sure. Uh, so specifically, the goal with uh, gamification is not to provide a generic overview experience, but to provide a tailored specific user experience that's very personalized to the individual. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you have to really focus on data analytics, data acquisition, and data collection. The quality of data and also the different data channels that you can receive this information. Uh, once receiving this information, you know, strengthening research and development efforts, performing clinical trials, working with um, additional um, leaders in the wellness industry as well, um, what you tend to do is typically look at this data and say, okay, are there any KPIs, key performance indicators or metrics that correlate to well-being, stress, or an anxiety? And how can we display it in an engaging and interactive manner that not only um, keeps the user there and interactive, but really provides them with resourceful solutions that they can then take and you know, implement in their everyday lives. So I think that's the key with gamification is really saying, how can we translate data into providing a resource for user experience that's specific to you and the issues that you face. Fantastic. And Lloyd, final comment on this particular question, then I'll turn yeah. to the, the Q&As that have come No, through. I think those personalized outcomes are absolutely fundamental and that's going to be the nirvana that actually the, the outcome is, is, is solely dependent on, 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 on the individual. Um, in the meantime, though, I think if we do want parity of esteem with other forms of kind of uh, therapy, we actually have to have equivalence. And in terms of equivalence, we have to kind of have a look at the similar outcome measures uh, and be able to kind of track those. Um, and, and, and we need to kind of do these, not necessarily because they're the right ones, but we do need that kind of parity. Uh, and so that's kind of what, what SilverCloud has been doing for, for many years now in terms of our randomized controlled trials. And interestingly, we published last year in, in Nature um, our first long-term uh, longitudinal study randomized control trial and what we found that after an episode of care after just eight weeks um, about 56 percent of people had kind of um, recovered from, from their depression and anxiety but what's really interesting when you kind of discharge someone from care normally what you hope is people maintain those gains over time 
But with the power of digital, that's always accessible beyond that discharge. And so what we found was that not only did people continue to kind of um, maintain those gains, they actually improved over time. So at 12 months, there was a further 50% reduction in terms of their symptoms, which is almost unheard of in, in traditional therapy. And that's because you can kind of see that that digital is, is constantly accessible. You don't have to remember the tools, the techniques, the approaches that you went through maybe six, nine, 12 months ago it's always available to you. And that's kind of the power of digital. And therefore, what we, we've kind of shown is that there is that equivalence, that actually you can show that digital is as powerful as other forms of, of help that's, that's available. And not only that, you actually maintain and keep those gains over time, it, that they stay with you. Absolutely. So that's really, really interesting. You mentioned you, you, you've got very citable, high quality evidence that, that is a testament to that, what you just said, because I know there's a bigger question around can digital therapy ever be as good or even can it indeed be better than, than sort of traditional forms of therapy. So I'm going to turn to one of our questions here um, where we've got um, attachment is key to therapy. Tech information can supplement this, but can it ever replace this core human connection? So that's a really interesting question. So can each of you sort of, uh, you know, um, I guess provide your perspective on that? Because it is fundamental to whether digital can even be better or indeed uh, be comparable or, you know, where does it compare, so, uh, so to speak? Uh, who would like to go first on that? I, I'll just uh, very quickly oh, jump in because yeah. I guess in, in terms of therapy, if, if I was to have a, 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 a session with a therapist or a counselor or whoever, um, if I missed that appointment for whatever reason, I might be upset, I might be a, a little bit uh, kind of uh, annoyed, et cetera, frustrated. Um, but if I go to the shops and leave my mobile phone at home, I'm bereft. Um, I unfortunately these days there's an equal attachment to a physical device uh, as there is to kind of other humans because that is how we gain human interaction and human connectedness particularly during the pandemic so so I think yes you can have that attachment maybe very it may be different and, and we can define it in different ways but there is that 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 attachment to devices because often that is our gateway to that connectedness mm, absolutely anyone who'd like to comment uh, Amir on that question about human yeah, I, I still have a piece of my psychology that's, you know, an anti-technologist as well, funny enough, you know, and I don't want technology to overstep itself. I don't want us to be uh, trying to replace human interactions with technology in any shape or form. I think as a supplement, it is where period I would want it to stop. That said, I feel like I'm a, a Luddite talking like this. You know, I think if you look at the trends of what's happening with, uh, if you, if you, if you take note of what's happening with virtual beings and avatars infused with AI learning based chatbot technology that can actually, you know, um, uh, trick a human being through a Turing test actually into believing it's real, then perhaps we can go down a path where um, I'm absolutely wrong and that the virtual um, environments and virtual settings um, can actually replace uh, quite a bit of a segment of what we actually think can only be done and accomplished in the real world and that Lloyd is absolutely correct that it has its place. Um, but I personally don't want that to be the case in my lifetime. Um, I would like it to be a, um, a supplement that helps us, enables us, and that can tr help us transcend um, the kind of barriers that suddenly befall us when we're isolated in the very surreal ways that the world has kind of shown us uh, these past couple of years. Yes, absolutely. Um, no, really, really interesting. Um, I don't know if Bruce or, or Aaron would like to comment on this, but I know, uh, ha I, I remember reading that, you know, there's quite a lot of people who would prefer uh, to, to chat to a chatbot rather than a real person because of, you know, because, you know, we all have, have our own biases as a human being. So I don't know, I, just a, a comment just to throw out there, but um, Bruce and Aaron, I'll come to you as well on this question. Bruce, you first. So, so our feeling is that it is a, a companion tool. Technology can make both even the experience even better and more uh, and more effective. And I think for carers, uh, we help to engage really hard to engage audiences and with um, uh, reminiscence therapy, where you can um, calm situations where the carers can feel more uh, positively that they're interacting, but also changes the dynamic of, a, of an experience instead of uh, uh, hi, Dad, how are you doing today? And Dad's not sure who you are and, and gets anxious and, and maybe even um, you know, can escalate into, into aggression. Um, you sit down and say, let's play a game. And it opens up and it's pictures of his wedding and who's this? And all of a sudden that can just 
radically change that social interaction. So I think there's a technology can not replace, but I think it can really benefit. And that's where we see it. Absolutely interesting. Erin, uh, any comments on the human aspect? Absolutely. The human aspect and in-person therapy is essential and it's effective and it cannot be replaced. However, if you look at at-risk dem demographics, specifically suffering from specific social determinants of health, uh, specifically uh, financial, economic, um, social, typically these individuals may not have the funds or the means to visit an in-person therapy session, which typically may cost more than a digital session. Additionally, they may not have the resources to travel or the funds to get there. So I think there's a, uh, you know, there's a two-sided street here where I, I believe that um, in-person therapy is effective. However, a digital platform provides a larger range of experience and opportunities to individuals who may not be able to have the in-person um, experience with a therapist. Really interesting perspective and, and very important as well. Um, so I'm going to turn, there's a couple of other questions. Uh, so uh, we're going to go into, I guess, a little bit more discussion around the, the, the different segments of the population who um, are benefiting or in highest need of this sort of uh, therapy. Um, so one question here is, being that everyone has been affected by the pandemic, what struggles have you all had creating content in your social spaces for age plus four? So, um, so I, I, and I know Lloyd, your, you deal specifically for this age group. I don't know if you want to comment on this first, but I'll, yeah, I'll let everyone. Yeah. So, so in terms of kind of creating content, uh, we ob uh, obviously have our own in-house team, but we we normally engage with subject matter experts in in the relevant areas because we we know that there are experts that we need to to kind of really lean on in ter terms of that kind of content uh, development, but also in terms of a kind of user engagement and 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 code co-design uh, with user groups. So uh, we haven't found that the pandemic has necessarily uh, kind of impacted that. There's been a greater need in, in different approaches. So for example, when the pandemic hit um, back in March uh, and we went into the first lockdown in the UK, um, we developed a special space from COVID-19 program. Um, and that was very kind of unique because what we had to do was to kind of address that this wasn't necessarily mental illness. This was people were experiencing a very normal reaction to a very abnormal event. And so what we had to do is kind of change the way that we approach these things um, to kind of build on some of people's coping strategies um, that they might not be able to rely on, such as social connectedness, social networks, you know, and all of those things. So we had to kind of change the way that we, we kind of looked at, at some of the content that we created. But in terms of kind of engaging with those subject matter experts, uh, user groups, we just had to kind of uh, rely on technology to do what we would have ordinarily done in, in person. Okay, um, anyone else want to come on that in on that question? Um, creating social spaces for age plus four, so just slightly so the, 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 the sort of the child's age group. Anyone? I mean, I know, Bruce, you're not focused on this particular segment, but I don't know if Aaron or Amir, you want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah and, and just, just to kind of clarify, in terms of the age plus uh, four, obviously we're, we're not looking at kind of engaging with the, those particular uh, children at that age. Well, but what we do know is a lot of the therapeutic value is delivered by parents so, so, and, and carers um, that, that are looking after their children. So if we can help uh, uh, parents and carers look after their mental health, they can kind of also then deliver the therapeutic value uh, for, for perhaps an anxious child. And so that's kind of where, where our programs uh, really kind of uh, rely on, on that particular age group. I mean, I guess it, it begs the question, I mean, what is the sort of the minimum age for, for these sorts of tools? I mean, does anyone have a perspective on that? I mean, I haven't really thought of, you know, I mean, I would, I would hate to think that someone as young as four would need this sort of support, but I would imagine, but what, at what age, you know, have you found, you know, as a particular segment that these sorts of technologies can be of use? Like for virtual reality, please do not have any uh, a child uh, under, well, I would say 13 is a safe age, uh, under seven is uh, criminal, um, you know, because I, I think with virtual reality, it's such a, it's such a, um, um, it, when you do have your autonomic nervous system believing the, it, it's real and you're an adult, um, I, I, I can't fathom what it's like to be a, a, a human being that's developing um, their reality to begin with, um, you know, spatial orientation, all these things are still forming up to, I think, seven at least. And, 
and um, to, to, to bring in virtual reality, I think it's not researched enough in long-term studies um, to be applied for that age group. So, yeah, uh, but I don't know if there's any sort of uh, any sort of guidance from regulation or anything like that that gives any sort of that. No, I wrote an article about how there's a lack of, of literature about it. To be honest, I, I think maybe they're they're tucking it under the table or something. But it, it's surprising actually um, that most hardware manufacturers will in, uh, say or write 13 years and above just as a general indication. Yeah. But there's not actually any um, any rules. But well, you know, there's a lot of um, ideas about virtual reality and what it's, you know, ramifications imply. For example, uh, proprioception. If you go into a VR simulation and you make your arms longer than your body actually recognizes they should be in length, that can cause, uh, you know, certain um, issues. So accessibility design and all these kind of things, I think they're even of a higher caliber of, of, of um, mm. best practices required there. Absolutely. Um, so I, um, I'm going to, there's a few more questions coming through. Um, so there's one here, dozens of BCTs, I think that CBTs are known to exist. Which ones are the most important in your opinion? Um, and which ones are suitable to use via gamification? Um, and then I'll tag on a related question. Um, the challenges in carrying out studies, randomized controlled trials to gather a body of evidence. So, so I guess the question is, what are the most important um, CBTs that exist and what is the evidence base attached to that in terms of you know, the, the classic randomized controlled trials, et cetera? Who would like to go first on that question? I'll jump into the okay. randomized controlled yeah. uh, trial piece. Uh, for us, we're, uh, we're running an um, a observational study, it's called, but it's an RCT with 30 pairs of patients and carers. Uh, and what I think the interesting part is recruitment isn't appearing to be very difficult at all, but the uh, innovation I think that needs to come is remote clinical trials. So a real step of uh, a Zoom um, um, interaction to, to ensure adherence and those kind of things. I think that could really, um, again, take us right across um, Africa. We're doing work in Uganda where they would like to participate in those trials and in Philippines, right in the rural Philippines. And they said that we would love to extend this um, trial you're doing in the UK into our regions. Um, and so if we can find ways to do more, more innovation around that remote uh, and data verification and adherence uh, by remote clinical trials, I think that would be incredible and cut the cost massively so that people don't have to come in to your trials. Yeah, that's absolutely a huge advantage. Um, now, anyone else would like to come in on that question of the trials and the evidence supporting the best technologies? Um, I, I, I can kind of come in on, on that one. In terms of kind of the best CBT, uh, again, there there are, as has as been mentioned, dozens. Uh, we're, we're actually kind of looking to uh, new approaches such as the unified protocol, um, which is a really interesting kind of CBT technique, which is transdiagnostic. So rather than focusing on the CBT for depression or for anxiety, look at the commonalities of the kind of the tools and techniques um, uh, across that. So, so we're kind of looking at how we can kind of digitize things like that that unified protocol um, so, so we can kind of take a much more holistic, uh, more round, rounded kind of approach. Um, and in terms of kind of randomized control trials, yeah, the, the, the problem is that, that you may want kind of, again, to kind of Aaron's point, maybe he wants to kind of come in on this, you know, the, those kind of personalized outcomes are very difficult to kind of get in terms of uh, RCTs. The other thing is that obviously um, with RCTs, you do want kind of a wait list or you do want to kind of not, not give the active ingredients Ingredients, but often when you are kind of in services, you have to kind of give um, someone something. You can't withhold treatment. And so partly that control group is, is, is the hardest group to kind of uh, get purity for an, a traditional RCT. Um, and the biggest problem is time. You know, we, we're kind of living in a really kind of fast paced world where there's new innovations and an RCT takes you years to kind of conduct. And so that's a massive kind of limiting factor on, 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 on randomized control trials. And, and just while I have that, you, uh, uh, Lloyd, what, what we had to do on the control, because it was, you're absolutely right. We created a very, very basic version of our app. And then our personalized version of the app is what we're putting through the, the official trial and having the placebo of still not nothing, because we didn't think that was a fair test. It really is still a basic, because the, the people who didn't get it, they have to use something. So they have mm. a very, very stripped down basic app. And then our full personalized app is, the, uh, is, is put through the trial. 
interesting. Um, and Lloyd, there's a question here just to give a little bit more detail on, on your longitudinal, longitudinal study um, and the follow up there. Do you want to just comment on that? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm happy to kind of forward that. It was published um, by the Nature Journal uh, Digital Medicine, uh, I think back in June last year. Um, it took us four years to conduct um, in terms of that that kind of trial itself. So again, kind of comes back to, to that point, um, looking at kind of those those kind of uh, treatment groups. Um, the the kind of the outcomes were were fantastic. As I said, about 56.4 percent of of people no longer met diagnosis for anxiety and depression at discharge, and then a 50 percent further reduction, very significant kind of change between 12 months and, and uh, pre and post. Um, and yes, uh, please, I'll be very happy to kind of send out my contact details and, and send that kind of paper across. Fabulous. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions here that have just come through. One's on actually being a bit more precise on what we mean by gamification. Mm -hmm. And related to that um, is an, a question to, to what extent might gamification lead to overstimulation or gameplay addiction and what could be done to mitigate this risk? So um, who would like to answer that two part question? You know, in terms okay. of how we. Aaron, oh, sorry. I'll let Aaron go first, and then I've got some VR-related questions for you, Amir, in a second. Um, Aaron, I apologize, Amir. Sure. So um, in regards to gamification, um, leveraging mechanics and other digital elements associated with games in a non-game context or setting. Um, so, so typically, I guess the most impactful ones are, you know, things that make the application simple, but the users can still provide data and information in order to receive the solution needed. So simple as progress bars or other interactive features, if they're performing a health risk assessment or achievements and um, you know, some type of point system when they have a personal wellness reward, um, contest for wellness challenges or some type of like digital breathing synchronization um, with like their breathing and use, utilizing aromatherapy um, with guided breathing. So those typical things um, are very impactful. However, you wanna be very specific with the amount of usage of gamification because you don't want to um, overindulge on it with the user, right? So you wanna make sure that the user specifically, um, they're using it and it's, so Elevate, Elevate typically uses research-based reminders. So we use timely reminders, we use user-based information and predictive analytics to be timely and be relevant. Um, not to, you know, provide too much detail, but to do enough where we feel like though, you know, this is it. Cause social media, apps, technology can be addictive and it's, hypocritical in a sense. Um, it's a, you know, like this, this two way thing where you're providing a solution utilizing digital platform, but you don't want to make it addictive and make it a, a harmful thing to the user. So it's being aware of that and knowing when to implement those strategies. Fantastic, Aaron. Who, uh, is there anyone else on, on the, the panel who'd like to um, make we'll a point? Really more. quickly, uh, yeah. our average session times are uh, just approaching 10 minutes now of gameplay. And again, we use really, really simple quiz style games, multiple choice kind of simple, but there's no wrong answers. There's the, the number one complaint we get from people is how come there's no scoring? And we said, well, cause it's not for you. It's up for the dementia patients and carers. And so when you get a wrong answer, it gently disappears. There's no wrong. There's always a path through. So we think there's a way to do gamification where it's not about the score. It's about the re about uh, rewarding the experience and just enjoying it. So where there's no, no negative part of the gamification. I think that's really important, especially with dementia patients. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to turn to Amir with a couple of uh, more sort of specialist questions. Um, because uh, we talk a lot about access and access accessibility, and I know that's uh, very much the heart of Bruce and, and Aaron, your business in particular. Um, uh, and I know that one question here is about um, access to obviously the hardware VR, because potentially that could limit access. Um, and also, and related uh, to the VR question is the conduit indications um, mm. uh, to VR as well. Um, uh, avatars, you know, clients who are, um, who are splitting or in psychosis, for example, what are the safeguards? So Amir, I'll over to you on those two particular questions? You know, in terms of the hardware, if it was a few years ago, the, the price of the headsets have dropped by three times. You know, it's just, if, it, if, if, you know, the current bleeding edge hardware is by Facebook, it's the Oculus Quest 2, it's $300. Um, you know, that's a very affordable price compared to what it used to be just a couple years ago and, and for what you get in terms of the, the content that's available in this library. So I think accessibility is becoming something that the hardware iteration cycle is just so rapid with VR. So if it's uh, uh, out of reach right now for you, 
um, just wait some months. Uh, it's, it's that fast and how it's changing and unfolding. Um, I'm hoping with, with, you know, in the next year or two, you're going to have a lot more um, accessibility in terms of a variety of hardware players rather than just one. And that should even um, make things even, even better on that stage. So I'm very hopeful there. In terms of anyone who's creating VR oriented, you know, uh, applications should always have someone on their team that is focused on accessibility design. We certainly did right from the very beginning. When we prototype games, we have to uh, take into account whether um, the, the games can be adaptable and accessible to people who are standing or sitting. If they're mobility restricted in a wheelchair, the game will need to adapt for those conditions. If it's uh, something related to color blindness, these kinds of accessibility features are built into our games as preferences and features to add on to. And that um, makes a whole order of magnitude uh, more complication in designing these things where we collaborate with game designers who are collaborating with neuroscientists and sometimes mathematicians and accessibility designers. And it becomes a, a theater of, of talent. Um, but it's very easy to go wrong in VR. Um, it's very easy to create bad content that will have, uh, you know, contraindications, but it really is respective to what is your particular application. For us, we're creating closed loop games, um, which basically are three minutes maximum of your time. It's very uh, unlikely that you're going to habituate to this game um, in that duration of period. So for us, it's, it's limited to making sure that it's as maximum comfort to the user as possible. And uh, just on that question of, you know, those who are in psychosis or who, who are at risk, you know, of these sorts of experiences, how do you, how do you make sure that those don't become problems? We've never run into it with closed loop games and in, 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 in our particular format, we've never come across or we never target any, any groups that aren't typically in the healthy aging or healthy group. Um, our, our solutions never applied to necessarily, um, um, you know, those types of risk groups. Um, so I don't have too much insight into that, um, but I, I'm sure it's something that has uh, has a, its particular challenges. And if that person who asked that question would like to get an answer to that question, they can email me, um, and I will find the right person in that field to to help you there. Okay, that's great. And uh, I mean, we've got um, we're a little bit uh, running out of time. A little bit. We've still got quite a few questions. I'm just going to go through a couple. Um, and there's a few that perhaps could be answered on the, the chat. For example, I know one um, uh, on Elevate, uh, is it the brain training app or the mental health app? I think that was on the chat, if, if you could get back on that particular question. Um, but there's a question here to the point about, you know, which is also related to the accessibility question about, you, you know, accessibility in terms of the experience and the, the whole user interface and working with artists, game designers, et cetera, and, and potentially doctors, et cetera. Um, is, is it science led? Uh, so this is the question. How do your companies currently collaborate with artists and games designers to create these experiences? Is it science-led and a more top-down approach or do you work in a collaborative development process? Who would like to have a stab on that question? I'll, I'll jump in really quick. Yes. Um, sorry. Uh, for example, the Philippines uh, Alzheimer's Association, uh, they have a team of neurologists, psychologists, speech therapists, clinical researchers, all on the board of the Alzheimer's Association there. And they're building games in the local languages for our platform. So based on where you download our app, you'll get this local localized gaming experience uh, for, you know, designed for dementia patients and carers. So for us, we're using um, speech therapists are really leading a, a lot of what we're doing, but um, we're finding great, great support from, uh, from Alzheimer's associations around the world and their, and their medical community to mm -hmm. get involved. Fantastic. Any other response to that question? From the we, we have 3D artists working with Unity 3D game developers using an engine specifically for virtual reality um, who are working in collaboration with a neuroscientist who's going into a library of, of the battery of commonly used you know, assessment tools like the NBAC task and the Stroop test. So it's a messy process of prototyping these, but usually in the early stages, once that collaboration gets to like a kind of a polished MVP, then we'll have like one of our partners like the Pacific Brain Health Center or the ARP also give their input in, in the design process. And only then we'll bring it to beta and beta will invite some people of our players to, to use it. So it's a, it's a really rocky, crazy crazy road on the VR side of things, but, but I think uh, worthwhile and fun. Fantastic. So um, 
I've got one question here, which I might ask either Lloyd or Aaron to answer, and then I'm going to ask a general question where you see the future um, and what are the sort of the take home messages from the session. So we've got a question here. How can an individual evolve as a person, given the analytical data? Does the analytical data give the individual a chance to grow over time? Uh, Aaron or Lloyd, do you want to have a stab at that question? Sure, I'll go for it. Okay. Um, great question. Um, in regards to analytical data, um, we typically provide analytical data in the form of some type of user-friendly um, experience or design. So rather if it's charts, graphs, a PDF email to them, and we typically monitor that data and compare that data, you know, against their wellness run rate over time. So we're not just saying, hey, here's, here's your solution, you know, have a good day. It's, you know, this is great progress. Let's see how we can improve on this moving forward. Um, we also communicate with the individual. We perform beta testing bench testing, we communicated and worked with UI, UX designers and developers and other therapists and behavioral specialists and say, okay, in what format is this data um, easily presentable to them? What is necessary? What is impactful? What works? What doesn't work? Um, additionally, as a control engineer, we work in, I work in situational awareness where certain data indicators, certain alerts and alarms may be overwhelming to the user. So we need to specifically and scientifically identify what is impactful, what works, um, and what can be used to build upon our progress moving forward. Fantastic, thank you, Aaron. Uh, Lloyd, do you wanna comment on that? Or would you like to give your, and maybe touch also on the future because we're gonna, we're sort of wrapping up soon now as well. <laughs> no worries at all. Um, in, in terms of kind of using analytics, uh, we've been working on machine learning uh, protocols for the last uh, two, two years with a very large partner. Um, and what we've uh, looked at is, is how people interact and engage with, with kind of the programs. And so we, we actually can kind of uh, track um, which bits of the program they use, how long they spend, how, how they engage. And, and actually what we've, we've done is been able to segment uh, five different types of user and we can then predict the outcome um, based on how they interact with the program. And that's going to be really exciting for the future uh, and, and uh, in answer to your, to your next question, because if we know that how someone interacts and we know what the, the level of outcome they might, uh, they might achieve, we can then start to kind of tailor the content, the presentation and the time and frequency of that according to that individual's kind of profile or, or user need. So, so for me, that's kind of the exciting bit where we can move to truly personalized kind of content delivered at the right time in the right way for that person to, to kind of gain the maximum benefit. And I think that's kind of the exciting thing about machine learning and data analytics and, and something that we're kind of moving towards at a great rate. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lloyd. Who would like to go next with their final words on, where the, on their, uh, the promise for the future? Bruce, do you want to have a go? Sure. Uh, so I completely agree with personalization. For us, we're about to release our personalization models. Well, families will uh, upload their own family photos, videos, and experiences into the app to, um, to, to personalize um, the therapy for their loved ones. And we think that is it's not too far in the future. That is happening now. Um, I also think that um, um, innovations around uh, remote clinical trials, I think that that will happen, especially in the cases where you have patients and carers, where there can be some more uh, adherence measurements to it. But I also think that um, um, things like the German DIGA regulations, where there are new digital health regulations, I think those are just a breath of fresh air. Very, very clear, exactly what you need to do, fast track process to get in. Um, and I think we're, so we're lining up to be a uh, potentially a prescription app in, uh, in Germany uh, in dementia, you know, in a category with limited pharma interventions. So I think there's some really interesting things happening. Um, for us though, we started uh, building games for our moms. We uh, have the most simple, simple uh, free app to download for dementia care. And we're doing that localized around the world, premium options to uh, local or to uh, personalize for your family. But really, it's it's um, your. I think you know Tara Donnelly, the old CEO, CEO of NHS Digital, who said there's an inverse correlation between um, clinically validated apps and apps people love, and we're out to break that correlation. Absolutely, now that's a really good point. Um, Aaron, what would you say? What is what does the future hold, and particularly from the point of view of disadvantaged groups who need it most? Absolutely, I believe the future um, with disadvantaged groups is really getting boots on the ground. Um, predictive analytics, machine learning, um, all those things are great, but it's really getting boots on the ground and really identifying and understanding what are the needs of these at-risk demographics. This includes partnering and working with other collaborators in the industry 
um, nonprofit organizations, other specialists, um, and really performing, you know, testing in and working with individuals. Um, really strong and positive uh, pre-assessments, post-assessments, and really taking this information, analyzing it, and using it to provide a unique experience for those individuals. Additionally, I would like to say is also affordability. So providing a platform that's just not available for the financially equipped, but something that works for people of all different creeds, racial, demographic background, and financial status. Fantastic. And Amir, closing on the future, where, where do you see excitement ahead? Well, you know, people look at a lot of the, what's happening with different, you know, uh, rose-colored glasses. Um, you know, 5G is going to be coming in, rolling in, and that's going to have a dramatic effect on, on gadgets and gears where a lot of these devices, especially the ones we work with, which are still quite 1980s kind of like phone size, right, bulky, um, you know, with 5G, we're going to be able to actually offload a lot of the, the bulk and take a lot of that processing and, and take it and have that done elsewhere, That which means that this hardware is going to become thinner and lighter and, and much more um, seamless and hopefully one day even invisible. And I feel we're going down that path very, very uh, radically in the next 10 years. Um, and so I, I, I look at things like 5G as being things that are going to probably accelerate the, the fast iterations we're already witnessing even tenfold more. So mm -hmm. I think everyone should buckle up and prepare for a very wild ride ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amira. I think, um, well, I think we've answered pretty much all the questions, really, really great questions. So thank you to our audience um, for, for asking all these really amazing questions. I think we can see the future holds so much promise. And that is, I guess, the silver lining with the pandemic. It has is, it is accelerated some of the things that we're seeing here today. Um, so over to you, Angela. To close. <laughs> thank you, Tina. And thanks so much to, to you and to all of our panelists for this really excellent discussion. Thanks also for, to our audience for being so proactive with your questions and comments. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased that we got through so many of them. So that was absolutely brilliant. Look, I've put a link in the health in the um, chat to our health band show of which this panel is a part. It's a show that's running virtually in, uh, in May, and we'd love to host you all there. It's free to attend. So please feel free to sign up. Our speakers will be back. Uh, it's a great way to connect with people, if, especially if you have further questions from this panel, but also with a whole lot of other content that we have running throughout that week and in the lead up. But in the meantime, Thank you once again to our panel. Thank you, Tina, and thanks to our attendees. Bye-bye.